Hey, good morning. This feels a little bit like old times, isn't it? Me, you, a camera lens. Remember when this was all we had? I do. COVID, in fact, did take a lot from us. I miss so much of what it took, but I have fond memories of the camera and ironically, the connection that we built through this lens, even if the room was empty. Well, the room is empty again today. Anytime we have a calendar month of five Sundays, we like to suspend a gathering in person so we, we can serve our city together in organized ways. And maybe you've joined us for one of those in the past if you're in town, maybe you haven't. Maybe you're confused why a church would cancel a service. Just know that it's our attempt to remind ourselves that love always moves. It always moves us from places of contemplation to places of action. But using the technology that we now have access to and working ahead a little bit, we can actually do both. We can serve and still have a message of some kind to gather around here. It might feel like Sunday morning to you, because it is. But this very moment feels a whole lot like a Thursday morning to me, because it is. Anyhow, you've probably noticed that I've been laying low this month. I've been around. I just haven't been shaping the thoughts coming at you from the front of the room. Sam and Trey and BT and Stan have done the honors. It felt good, frankly, to turn inside in a way that time doesn't always allow. But know this much as we emerge from the calamity and the delight of this global pandemic that I'll be turning inside with greater intention and greater intensity than ever before. Not unlike you, I'm learning what I can from this great pause. And I, like you, am making some important decisions about what work matters most and how best to square up to that work. For me, that work will be primarily internal in nature, at least for this season. Know that I'll be leaning into it as curiously as I'm able, knowing that true leadership is made of these very moments when we face ourselves compassionately, courageously, completely. I've just a few thoughts for you today on this fifth Sunday of service, and our text will be found in Mark chapter 12, but don't feel the need to turn there. I'll read it. It might feel familiar to you. Mark 12, verse 28. It reads this way. One of the scribes came near and heard them disputing with one another and seeing that he answered them well, he of course being Jesus in this case, he asked them, the scribe asked him, which commandment is the first of all? Jesus answered, the first is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And if you're a biblical purist, you would notice that Jesus adds something there to the Deuteronomic text. He adds with all your mind. I find that interesting. We could talk about that more in the future. Verse 31, the second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. That was Jesus' response. And then the scribe said to him, you are right, teacher. I just find this funny that the scribe would be evaluating Jesus. You are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one, and besides him there is no other, except that's not what Jesus said, but fair enough. And to love him with all your heart and with all your understanding and with all your strength, he leaves the mind out. Of course he does. He's a, he's a scribe, and it wasn't in the original text. And to love one, uh, one's neighbor as oneself, this is much more important than all of the whole than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Also summarizing a thought Jesus didn't say, but that's okay. Verse 34, when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. After that, no one dared ask him any more questions. I don't think we've understood Jesus. And don't worry, I'm not alone in this. These aren't just my questions. Don't get me wrong. I think we try, some of us literally for decades. Yeah, we go hard after this Jesus guy. We seem to be made of pure effort. Nothing if not persistent, we Christians. <laughs> but I'm not convinced we've understood him. Not really. Well, at least I haven't. I'll speak for myself here. I can't find a box that fits this guy. Jesus was not a prophet. Jesus was not a priest, and Jesus was certainly, certainly not a king. Oh, I'm aware different legitimate factions of Christianity have argued for each of these categories at one time or another, each using the sacred text that some of us still have affection for to underpin their cases. Now, don't mishear me. Jesus did speak about the future, but he wasn't a prophet. That's a very specific category of, of Jewish identity. 
an old one at that, a category with distinct insides and distinct outsides. There were prophets and then there were false prophets. No, Jesus spoke of things to come, but he wasn't a prophet. That was an office, one that he rejected again and again. And his almost bizarre disregard for the temple and all of its priestly rules and regulations should have told us conclusively that he was no priest. That too is a defined Jewish category, and it's not one that we get to tinker with as Western Christians because it makes us feel safe to call Jesus a priest. If just because we think we can smush an ancient historical figure into an oversimplified box of meaning, no, no, Jesus rejected the office of the priest as well, again and again. And although Jesus did in some ways represent a realm all its own, a place where things worked differently than they did in the socioeconomic backwaters of Rome, he was certainly no king. Kings amass power, kings issue decrees, kings keep armies because kings have enemies, kings hold the center of a particular polity because they think they take power and they defend it and they think it matters. No, no, friends, Jesus was no king. Again and again, he made that crystal clear. Which begs an interesting question. What then was he? Who even was Jesus? And if we can't answer that question, how will we ever figure out what he's trying to teach us? Now, take a deep breath. Our inability to answer the question, who even is this man, doesn't mean that we're dumb or dense or uniquely obtuse. For us, he's a long way back there. Even the folks who lived in his traveling entourage who saw him daily struggled to answer this same question. You remember the stories. Sometimes Jesus liked to come right out and say, so fellas, who do y'all think I actually am? I think you like to watch him flip-flop a little bit. Anyway, the scribe in today's passage was certainly trying to figure out who Jesus was. We know this respectable man had respect for Jesus by the dialogue Mark recalls between, them, between the both of them. Then the scribe calls him teacher, which I happen to like better than prophet, priest, or king. Teacher, says the scribe, which feels right, almost. Jesus was a teacher, but of what precisely? What exactly was he attempting to teach the world? I want to be honest with you, friends. I'm quickly unbelieving a lot of what I was taught. I'm beginning to surrender to the questions I was told not to ask. You know, questions about the role of the church, the scope of the Bible, the boundaries of grace, not to mention the future of the cosmos and the sinister algorithm I was told required the vast majority of, of my beloved human family to burn forever in some creepy underworld while it assured me of peace and comfort unending for good behavior. I'm questioning hard. I'm guessing the same is true for you or you wouldn't hear my dangerous and heretical voice right now. You would have already tuned us out. If you have not, it's very likely that what unites us is our common curiosity, our gnarly need to know the truth. Truthfully, deep questions about church and theology and the Bible aren't new for me. I've always been wonderfully inquisitive, but somehow, Probing the identity and purpose of Jesus in new ways feels new. And if I've tripped, it's, it's as if I've tripped some kind of internal emergency break that's supposed to stop me. It's a break that I'm choosing to ignore at this point, to be clear. That alarm served me well in childhood, but I'm an adult now. Figuring out who Jesus was feels central to me in my faith at this point, just like it must have felt to the scribe in our story today. He brought a single question. What is the first or what is the most important commandment of them all? Which is the kind of question you might expect from a Jewish scribe. A one-part question that received a two-part answer. A two-part answer from the beloved teacher describing a one-part world. Notice what two things Jesus welds together. Love of God and love of others. Heaven and earth, essentially. Love of the divine, permanently interwoven with love of the material. Yep, Jesus offers a teacher's answer. You know, one that argues with the premise of the question itself. Specifically, what I'm slowly beginning to recognize is that Jesus was a teacher in the wisdom tradition. Now, he wasn't the only one to emerge from the ancient Near East teaching wisdom. He may have been the first of his kind, and he was certainly my favorite, but others came along in time. It's true, not many in the West. Wisdom teachers mostly turn up in the East, which is why my body has been telling me for years to dig there, to mine those traditions for deeper harmony and integration. And we'll unpack this more in coming months, I promise. For now, internalize this idea. 
Wisdom teachers are primarily concerned with integration, with harmonization. They're mostly motivated to show how things are united, they're unified, they're blended into a single reality. Wisdom teachers tend to be less concerned with rightness and wrongness, less obsessed with inside and outside, less focused on binaries and tribal boundaries, and more intent on demonstrating how all things are one. Remember, the passage we read today might be the most significant summary of Jesus' identity. Most scholars see this exchange as the most concise statement of Jesus' contribution to the cosmos. One question answered in two parts, reminding us how things are really one single reality. Which is, my friends, the whole gospel in one movement, like the whole opera in a single note or the entire world in a single cell. How you interact with God is how you interact with others, and how you engage with others is how you engage yourself, which in turn is how you engage God. It's all one. Divisions are dead. Distinctions didn't survive the full unfolding. It's all been won through God's love. And this doesn't have to make us feel condemned or lazy if we're just now beginning to notice our neighbor. No, no, it's good to wake up whenever we do. The great wisdom teachers don't traffic in shame and smallness. They summon us to a deeper consciousness, to the deepest awareness that all things traced far enough back or forward for that matter become one in the end. And that's why we serve our city on Sundays like today. Not to gain anything. We serve with no hidden agenda because we serve because it's the only thing we know about love, that it moves, that it moves outward. You see, friends, our neighbors are us. We are them. They matter because we do. They are loved because we are. I wonder, can you see a world this integrated? If you can't, that's all right. Maybe seeing this unbearably beautiful world, the almost unmentionably integrated singleness of it all through the eyes of your neighbor, maybe that will help. Those are God's eyes too, as we're reminded in today's text. Anyway, it'll take a wisdom teacher to move us to this level of consciousness, and it'll probably take a lifetime to figure out all that he's trying to teach us, and that's okay. May your week be full of integration and breakthrough and new depths of awareness, new levels of consciousness. May your world be one. We love you. We'll see you back here next week.